Okay, hello everyone. Uh, real nice seeing you in, in, in this this much uh, in the, this number. It's always nice to see that the community getting together and exchanging ideas and talking about stuff and especially like testing and uh, quality uh, topics. Uh, I might glance a lot at my presentation because I have a lot of visuals, so uh, sorry in advance. But uh, my talk today will be about machine learning and how to test uh, machine learning uh, systems that use machine learning as their core functionality or as part of their functionality. So just a little, like a sentence or two about myself. Uh, I'm a senior quality assurance engineer, uh, automation engineer at Photomath. I've been working there for like a year. And before that, I've been working at various companies, uh, mostly in the role of automation engineer, but started as a manual engineer. Uh, some of you might know me uh, already. I'm also the organizer of the festival meetup here in Zagreb, and uh, since last year, also a co-organizer of the yearly conference. So if you're interested in, in the community, look us up on, on Facebook or other social media to get involved. Uh, okay, the agenda. Uh, before I get into it, uh, basically the reason for this topic today was that uh, more and more uh, products and uh, systems use machine learning and it's because it's become like a really hot topic word, hot topic technology. And it's also used in places where it really shouldn't be used and, and in places where it really finds a good application. So my idea is, in, in order to test something, we need to understand the basics of it, how it works. So without that understanding, it's very hard for us to find failure points for develop a good testing strategies to address, address maybe potential issues. So today, my plan, plan is to shortly explain what the are, and then, and then uh, uh, deep dive guy how they how they how they, how they work. How they work. Uh, uh, mention mention some, some type of network that's for the user and, and, and then in the end, end give some tips yes. uh, basically, basically what to avoid when testing, testing them, them which I've learned, learned working, working in Photomath which many of you probably know that we use AI systems heavily in our product. So, fair warning, there's some maths involved here because it's machine learning that has to be math, but I try to keep it as simple as possible. So, if you know what the function is, you'll be fine. Okay, uh, best, best way to explain it is through an example. So let's take like the most basic example possible. Uh, this is a caricature of a fruit, and let's say that uh, it has two main qualities. It has the number of spots and the length of the spikes. Uh, sorry, the spot size and the length of the spikes. And uh, those determine, we realize that those determine if the fruit is safe or poisonous to eat. So we want to create an algorithm, a machine learning system, that can differentiate uh, on a given input if the fruit is safe to eat or poisonous. So we take the data and we can graph it uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a plane. And we see if the distribution is random, that means there's no co correlation between uh, the spikes and the spots and the poisonous. So we can't do anything there. But if there is a correlation, we'll get something like this, maybe not uh, ideal case like this, maybe a grouping there, grouping here, but you get the point. You get groupings where certain sizes and lengths correlate to it being safe or not. So we want to design a system that will test and give us the answer for this. Uh, to be able to do that, we're going to use neural networks. And neural networks are basically a general approximator function. Uh, what this means is that a neural network, given enough data in the beginning, can approximate the underlying function. Uh, it's the same, uh, it's an idea from, from math. So if we have some data points and we don't know the original function, we can use some math and try to approximate the original function and get a really good idea of how it looks like. We can also do that if the data is a bit fuzzy. So if there's some randomness, we can get still a good approximation of the original function. And uh, with neural networks, we can create a function that closely approximates the original function. The more data we have, the better the approximation will be. Okay, so let's construct our neural network. First, we start out with our inputs. So it's input one, input two for the spot size and the spike length. And then we have our two outputs. Is it safe to eat? Is it poisonous? And we connect them uh, with lines. And for each of those lines, those are basically calculations, we give some weight. These weights are not set in the beginning, but we will manipulate them later. And we end up with two uh, calculations that give us basically how this data relates to, the, to our desired outcome. And we just multiply them together and add them in the end. So now that we have this, let's try to 
implement the weights and then play around with them to see what happens uh, on the graph. So we start by changing them and we can see, okay, there is uh, a function that is covering a certain part, but it's locked to the origin point. We cannot move it around. That means we can never cover uh, this area that we want to actually cover. So to do this, we need to add uh, a bias or basically just another uh, constant that will translate it on the y uh, axis. So to do that, we added it and now we can play around with it a little bit. And now we can see that we can actually move the function and we already get a really good approximation of uh, the original function that determines uh, <coughs> if the fruit is safe or poisonous. So this is fine. We have already a solution. If we input uh, some new data into this function, we'll get a result. Maybe it's like 90% positive uh, that it's safe and like 10% that it's poisonous. But data rarely looks like this in the real world. So what we, uh, is that okay? What if we have some other data like that that has like a parabola choice? Uh, uh, missing the word. Never mind. It has this shape here. <laughs> so <coughs> we cannot do it anymore with our linear function. We need some some way to curve it. So to do this, uh, we can add some more uh, neurons. Uh, into our network. Each of these points are called a neuron and they do some calculation. So we can add a middle layer and usually this is done uh, by approximation or by prior experience. There is no real fast rule for this. So let's just add three and we'll connect them as well like in the beginning and now we have more connections and more weights that we can manipulate and more biases. And now we can play around with them. So we start and we can see that nothing really much changes. It's still a linear function. We still cannot approximate this curve. So to do that, we actually need to make our function uh, nonlinear and enable us to have interruptions in our, in our function and basically cover the desired area. So to do this, uh, for each neuron, we add what's called an activation function. An activation function basically tells us uh, to do another certain calculation on the weighted input. So when we get the input, we say, okay, only activate it, only display it, or produce a one for the next step of the calculation if the input value is above some certain threshold. And this is called the activation function. So there are many, uh, many of those functions. The easiest one is a step function, where we basically say, okay, if the input is above a zero, it's a one, if it's anything other than that, or if it's a negative value, just uh, zero it out. What this enables us then to do is trigger activations in just cer certain areas. We already can see that we now have uh, different ways of covering the function, and now we have a good approximation uh, of which fruits are safe and which, which fruits are poisonous. But there is another issue here uh, with this approach, is that there's still some very sharp points, so it's not smooth. We cannot do uh, smooth curves or areas. And also, uh, the, the function is very abrupt. So small changes, equal to big ch small changes in the input equal to big changes in the output. Ideally, what, what we want to have is small changes in the input producing small changes in the output. And we can try some other ones. The most uh, used one for like, uh, light neural networks is the sigmoid function which will basically just smooth out the function. Or this is really a ReLU uh, a rectified linear unit, uh, which is uh, one of the most popular ones. So if we apply that, we see now that the weights have changed a bit because of the input values. And now we have a much smoother transition. We can manipulate it much easier and we cover our data set uh, much better. But this is all manual work. We still need to fiddle with the weights and the biases. What we want to do is to teach the network to teach itself on some data and then generate some results. <coughs> so to do that, we need to tell the algorithm a way of discerning which set of weights is better than another set. Because if you just brute force and just say, okay, do all permutations of weights and biases, it doesn't know which one to prefer. It doesn't know how to learn. So what we introduce is called a cost or a loss function where we just take the ex output activation, so the output of the activation function, and then uh, take out the expected output. And then just to, be, to uh, emphasize the difference, we just multiply together. 
So to have like a small change be a big difference. And this will basically tell us how far off a certain combination of fates and biases are for the uh, expected output. So now uh, there is a, uh, maybe you can see it, there is a cost here at the uh, bottom and there is our data set. So there is 91 blue points, which are our uh, expected output and currently uh, 55 are correct. And now if we play around, we can see as the number of correct guesses increases, the cost decreases, which means the algorithm is more optimized. It's closer to, to, to the actual correct output, to the desired output. So we now have a way to tell the, the algorithm that uh, a function uh, is uh, a certain set of weights and biases is better than another one, so it can compare them. But how does it know to determine the lowest values? So when the cost is as close to zero as possible. Uh, if we graph the cost, so this is just for one dimension, for one input. If we graph it as a function, and like this is our, knew that would happen. Never mind. Uh, if this is a, a low point in our cost value, then we have another uh, point uh, uh, there, uh, a low point. We know that we want to be either here or there, ideally here, but maybe that result is also good enough for, for uh, our use. What we do to, the, to calculate this is use a technique called gradient descent, and this is the most complicated math I'll mention here. Uh, gradient descent basically allows us to um, more efficiently reach this point. It works by calculating the slope. So as you saw, there is a certain slope and we can uh, calculate a value for it. It's usually done by taking the derivation of it, but you can also approximate it by a na naive approach of just comparing the functions. And then we tell it, okay, take a random point in the cost value, tweak the, the weights and see where you end up. Are you moving left or right? Is the slope increasing or decreasing in value? And we tell it to repeat that a lo lots of times. And we see that it, in the end, ends up at a low point. And we can also dictate how big these jumps are by tweaking the learn rate, which is just a multiplication in the, in the function. So now we are able to tell it how to reach this uh, minimum point. And to visualize it in two dimensions for two weights. Uh, is it playing? Okay, so we have two weights and we have some cost value. We'll bring it up to a certain value. And for two, it's not gonna be a function, it's gonna be a slope now. And we want to reach these minimums. We apply the gradient descent, which works in any n number of dimensions, and we'll reach a minimum. The issue with this is that you saw there's uh, lower minimums, higher minimums, which are called local minima and global minima. Perf uh, usually you want to end up in the global minima. And to do that, we apply certain uh, tweaks to the algorithm. Uh, most usually we call uh, what we call stochastic gradial descent, where we take batches of data and just randomly throw it at the gradient descent and see what ends up. Basically, we wiggle around the cost to escape the local minimums if possible. So now we start learning and very, very quickly we end up, the cost is still decreasing and now it's found a good approximation of the function. So now our neural network can actually learn. We gave it some input. It can learn, find the minimum of the cost, and it knows for this cost, the weights and biases, and it configures the neural network with those, and we can now give it new data, and it will process them same as this. This is all fine for like two inputs, but what we have, if we have a huge neural network, then the, this approach falls apart because it's very inefficient, very slow. So for these kinds of networks and basically all networks that are uh, used today, uh, we use algorithm to reduce the number of calculations. Usually what I did before is to take, uh, uh, take an input and move it through the entire network and at each point calculate the weights, the biases, the cost and the gradient descent function. What's usually used is called back propagation where you start at the end and then take the value and don't calculate for each point, but calculate for each layer. And you tweak around the weights and biases to find the minimum for that layer and then move backwards, which saves a lot of time. And now uh, a more real world example. For example, this is an image. Uh, these are some hand-drawn numbers. The image size is 28 by 28 pixels. 
and we have a total pixel count and the value of the pixels can range from zero black or uh, one uh, which is white. So how would we approach to do uh, this kind of thing? Well, we'll cre create another neural network and each pixel will be an input to our function. So now we have 784 uh, inputs, which is a huge amount of uh, inputs. Then we have also all these uh, middle layers or hidden layers in between. And uh, if you remember the slope that I showed for just two weights, this slope, if you can call it, will be in 784 dimensions minimum. So we cannot really represent that visually, but using the mathematical concepts, we can calculate uh, still the results. Just to give you like a concept, an idea of how we would approach uh, of solving this is, imagine for that number that you just saw, each of the pixels are grouped. So for a six, there is a certain number of grouping of points in an n-dimensional space that tells you if this grouping is recognized, that that must be a zero or a one or a two. So this is 3D, but imagine this being in n dimensions. Okay, so the hard part is over. <laughs> Hope you, you, you were able to follow. Uh, it's quite a lot and quite, quite in, a, in a quick succession, but we can talk after and you can rewatch the presentation to get uh, a bit more details. Okay, so the types of neural networks. There are many, these are just the top 10, I think, or, or even like top eight. There are many, if, when I did the research, there were over like 20 or 30. Uh, what we did now is a feed forward neural network, which basically means it doesn't cycle, it doesn't loop. You just forward the output and input from one layer to the other, to the next one. And uh, it, it can also be classified as a multi-layer perceptron. Perceptron basically classifies data for a given input it uh, tells you if the input is what you expect or not. Uh, one uh, very common uh, evolution on this feed-forward neural network is convolutional neural network. You probably hear, if you heard anything about neural networks, you, you, you would have heard this one. Uh, this one basically takes from the image, pixelated image of a number, it takes a grouping of the pixels and considers that as an input. So it doesn't take each individual pixel as an input, it takes a grouping and then the rest is basically the same. It has some additional calculations, but it hugely reduces the complexity of inputs and then calculations. Okay, usages. So there are many, many usages. As I said, some are uh, justified, some are just buzzwords and marketing tricks. But anywhere where you have a huge data sizes and trends that you want to identify uh, and also have historical data, you can apply neural networks to more easily uh, get some val uh, valuable and meaningful data from it. So for, in for instance, one very good application is fraud detection where, and this is already used like for years in, in telecom companies, in banks and, and su uh, as such, where they have huge amounts of historical data which they already classified, uh, uh, annotated, which, which, which is fraudulent transactions, which is valid transactions. They can train a neural network on it and then in real time if the model detects a pattern of a fraudulent detection, it can trigger a warning and immediately flag a transaction as fraudulent without a person having to manually sit there and watch the transactions, which is not even possible with the amount of transactions going on today. So and now to the good part, uh, testing these systems. So when it comes to testing these systems, it's all about the data. Uh, for, the, for the first point is ensure that the data is well prepared and annotated. So when testing, you need to know for each data point that you're giving the system, whether it, it be an image or a text file or any other file, you need to exactly know uh, what it is and what the expected output is. Uh, because without that, the neural network can output anything and you wouldn't know what the, what the actual expected outcome is. So this is, uh, this is very important and also important to uh, have a, a good representation of the data that you want to cover. So you can ha specialize uh, very hard in one certain like uh, use case or scenario, but then you neglect a whole other region of, uh, of the test data that can appear in production and that in testing you didn't catch. You need to agree with everybody that's working on it and the stakeholders on the target accuracy. So models work with accuracy and no model will ever be 100% accurate for all possible inputs. So you need to agree what the acceptable limit is for your model in, in, in your product that you want to reach. And uh, everything above that is then a positive benefit, but if it's reached, that means the testing is successful. But you will still have some issues in production because as I said, they're not 100% guaranteed to work. 
and uh, yeah, there's this I already mentioned. Make sure that the data set is a good representation of real data. And to show an example, so in Photomath, what we do is we have a mobile application where you can take a picture of a mathematical expression and you get a result with steps. So we can prepare a data set like this, which is basically generated from LaTeX expressions or just uh, scanned from PDFs and, and textbooks and stuff like that. We can test the model with this, but our users are actually submitting images like this, like handwritten from blackboards, from notebooks and stuff like that. If we train our model exclusively on this, it might catch some of those, but it will not be as efficient. So our data set, however many images of this type we prepare, will never be as eff effective if we prepare it with that other data set. Then uh, it's very important to not use the data that's used for training the model because there's a high likelihood of it being able to recognize it because it was used to train it. So you can use those as a sanity check, what usually is considered like a smoke test in, in, normal, uh, in testing normal software. Here you use a subset of the data or the data if it doesn't take too long to just test, okay, the initial expectations are fine. Our training data set is completely recognized or maybe 99% recognized, which is good enough. Then you need to prepare a separate data set. That's a representation of your real data that will be coming into your application to test the actual effectiveness of your model. The performance is also very, very important because as you saw, the importance can escalate very quickly. So it's very important for a machine learning system to have good performance tests that test a lot of variation and, and a lot of different scenarios. Again, uh, tracking progression. So as I said, no model will be 100% uh, correct. So it's important to have historical data in testing to compare new iterations of the model that's trained on new additional data with older, uh, represent older, older versions of the model. And uh, another example from, from Photomath. So uh, we have a model that recognizes a uh, big number of ca math categories that we want. And now we're working, for example, on recognizing geometric uh, tasks. So you have a triangle with some missing sides and you want to identify the sides. The model did, was not able to recognize that before. So we trained the model on millions and millions of pictures of those kinds of tasks. And now we want to test, okay, how good is it at recognizing those tasks? And we can give it another data set, test it, and see. But what we need to check also is that the accuracy in the older stuff didn't decrease. Because what can happen really often is that you train the model on new data for a new iteration, and you get good results for the new feature, but some of the accuracy of the older ones degrade, which is not something you want. Maybe something, sometimes a deg degradation of 1% or 2% is acceptable because the new feature is so much better and so much more valuable to the, to the uh, customer, to the user. But generally, you need to keep track of that. So that's why it's important to have a really good regression. <coughs> OK, and that's, uh, that's it for the prepare stuff. Uh, I'm open to, to questions now. And yeah, anything that you want to ask, feel free. And we can also talk later if, if it's a bigger topic. <laughs> Thank you, Nico. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I have to say, I feel like I'm missing uh, some domain knowledge, at mm -hmm. least for the first part. Uh, but for the rest, it was quite, quite awesome. So any questions, comments, something? Yeah, there's also going to be, the, in the next slide, I have included some credits. So these are all the materials that I used. And I actually asked for permission for these YouTubers. So they actually gave me permission, which is nice. And uh, you can visit them. And most of the animations were from this uh, how to create a neural network, which is much longer and goes in much more detail and in depth. And you, if you're more interested in it, I highly recommend this one. And also uh, why neural networks can learn. This is the example from the function why it's possible to approximate, which is also a short video that explains the math, math behind it. Thank you. Any questions, comments? It was great. <laughs> Thanks. S sounds like your colleague is here. <laughs> no, they're there. They're there. Uh, well, uh, I have a very <coughs> maybe bas basic question, but it's related to uh, Photomath software. Mm -hmm. As you said, you need to train it on uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands, millions of uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Where do you find them? 
like how do you get i can uh, i can easily uh, think about how to get uh, 100 uh, good examples of uh, mathematical uh, uh, calculations or something like that but how do you get millions of them you and you know that they are good data so mm -hmm. they are verified in some way yeah that's that's the major problem with all neural networks as you start from somewhere uh, your accuracy and your data sets will be small in the beginning but after you gain some traction after you gain some users and this is also what happened to photomath so photomath start, started with a like lower lower uh, much smaller amount of data that they trained the models with and then once we had somewhat of a user base we we could then use all the scans from from the users to train the new iterations of the model and the more users you have the more data you can generate of course you need to take care that it's anonymized that it can be tracked uh, to the user that no private data is there but uh, it, then it's also a job of annotating it so you can collect all those images or you can find it somewhere but it doesn't mean anything to you if it's not annotated so you need to have teams or like hundreds of people who annotate the data who then which can then be used in training because in training when you give it you need to tell it okay this is correct this is not and in case of automat you, you need to tell it this is a quadratic ex uh, uh, equation this is trigonometry so classified and in photomath there's like 150 uh, people mostly students that work exclusively on annotating data so all the data that comes in they have a process of annotating it and then it goes into the learning processes and then it trains the neural networks and in the next iteration we expand the coverage basically okay thank you thank you uh, anyone else perhaps yeah here yeah, and also there's like now since it's so popular there's huge amounts of publicly uh, available data sets like these numbers that i showed for uh, for ex an example that that's a data set that's usually uh, used in like uh, teaching neural networks and it has thousands of images like those prepared already you can just download it and play with it and, and test it uh so it might sound a bit wild but i'll try to connect the previous presentation mm -hmm. with this one <coughs> what, what do you think about uh using machine learning for creating uh qa tests like it can be either exploratory or some test cases or something like that um, obviously getting the data would be the the hard part but let's say for example if you if you have some tracker or something on the site where you can track all the user actions and something like that, you can see what users are doing and something like that, and maybe annotate the data. What do you think it's possible to create uh, tests uh, using machine learning? Definitely, but as you said, there's the big, uh, the big challenge is data. So, uh, like data sets of a thousand or something are very small and not really viable, and, and you need to have like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And uh, in the end, un until you get that data, you'll already need a strong test coverage for that product. So it is something that could be done, but it's, it's going to be probably happening in the later stages of a product. Uh, and I don't see it happening in like smaller uh, product or, or from an agency or something like that, because it's just not worth the investment. You need to a lot, invest a lot to make it pay for itself, basically. Uh, the other thing is that there are already some tools that uh, promise like AI based uh, recognition or uh, for web interaction like that you can click on elements but again it only knows what it learned before so if you're using some other design for your elements or for your website it will probably be triggered and, and don't know that this is a login button or this is a submit button just for example so that that's the, that's the hardest part and uh, there is a way, so you don't really need maybe machine learning for cases like this, if you have good like event tracking in your app. So what we have in our app, uh, we have events fired for every user interaction. So every button you click, every menu interact with, there's a corresponding event that's fired into our uh, event system. And uh, when we try to create like a regression plan to see like which are the most used features, we just checked the counts of those. And then we saw, okay, to which feature is, it, is that related? And we created like a matrix, just like a spreadsheet, that we corresponded the actions with the flows and, and the counts. So there you don't really need neural networks. But in the future, there will be more applications. But for now, it's still, for testing, it's still like in the beginning. Okay. 
anyone else perhaps uh, then maybe another question from my side uh, if I understood you correctly you're actually writing tests that are testing the neural network itself but do you or how do you test your tests meaning how do you verify that they are actually providing the correct input no matter of the amount of data they are going over like I can mm -hmm. assume that when the data is some small amount uh, it's relatively easily detectable okay my test case is not valid it's uh, right giving me false negatives or something like mm -hmm. that but with the increase of the data how do you actually test your tests mm -hmm. yeah valid question uh, uh, and because as you said such a huge amount of data you cannot be 100 percent certain in your test that they're testing the right stuff so again quality of the data and the annotation is most important but the other thing is that you also then have a confidence level of your test so you approximate like based on on the, on the data set that you have and you know approximately how it looks like and how the annotation was done you can say okay for this data set i'm at most like 90 percent certain that it will cover uh, our desired use cases and then track from there maybe in the next iteration you can go over it again and then prune like the 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 images in our case that are not representative or they're maybe just bl too blurry or, or not valid as, as an input. So that, that's, that's basically you need to go through the data one way or the other. So that's, that's the ma major point. But historical tracking helps a lot because you can see from one model to the next if your assumptions hold true. Because if in the next iteration there's a big difference, that means that there is an issue in your data set. Okay, thank you. And the, and the test itself are ba so basic like they're just sending an API with an image and the uh, dimensions of the image and the uh, area where like because in the app you can specify like a rectangle where you want uh, the system to look that gets sent the model then returns what it thinks the mathematical expression is so what we do is we have a huge data set of images that we already know what the what the JSON should be of the expression and we send them on the new iteration of the model and compare them basically check if they're the input from before. So this is for mainly for regression. Okay, thank you. Anyone, anything in the meantime? Going once, going twice. Okay, sold. Uh, then uh, I would like to ask you for one big uh, applause for both my and Nico.